Hey guys, I've been doing a little more work on this Motorola 14P3 set and I have yet to find a smoking gun as to why the reception just isn't that hot. I've checked all the resistors and uh, really they were all been within 10%. I was quite surprised. I replaced a few because they were kind of right at 10%, but really I think I could have left all the originals in there and would have been fine. So I started rechecking the tubes and swapped a few. And uh, the only thing that's really stood out so far is that in the tuner, there is supposed to be a 4BQ7 for the RF amp, and I found a 4BZ7. But that is a recommended substitute, or an approved substitute, so... I don't know. I also don't have any 4BQ7s or 4BZ7s on hand, so I just left in there for now. I check the voltages on the IF amp. They seem to be quite close to what is called for. Didn't check the voltages in the tuner because it's kind of impenetrable inside this copper box here. So I then moved on to the video amp. There's only two IF stages in this, and like I said, they both checked out pretty close with those voltages. So I moved on to the 6AW8 video amp, or video output tube, and I did find some voltages there, particular pin 9, only about 50 volts, not 70. This is a two-section tube, and the other section is used for a sink separator. And if you recall from the first installment on this set, the sink is very touchy, vertical especially. You can see it's rolling right now. And when I checked out this, pin 3 should be 55 volts, and pin 2 should be minus 1.1. Well, on pin 2, I've got minus 19.3 or thereabouts, just say minus 19 volts. It's a far cry from minus 1.1 volts. So I'm going to start checking out the stuff here. That stuff's kind of interesting in that they try to help out the service tech and that there are various service points, including this service test receptacle. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what one would plug into that. I'm not entirely sure I know where it is. I know there are various test jacks for doing like an alignment, like there's one here, there's one here. I'm not sure where that service jack is. In fact, I didn't even notice it on the schematic. Ah, I bet that's it right there. Now, I don't know what device that might have plugged into. I certainly don't have it. And uh, in the SAMs, the service info is a little sketchy. But uh, at least uh, that's a point to start out at. So at least let's see what key voltages do they have. 125 volts, that's the main B plus supply. That I definitely have. I have that on 125 volts. And they're saying this test point 4 should be minus 0.1 volt. And that uh, is what eventually leads over to pin 2. And that's, I think, the AGC bus. So, well, that would make sense, just like in that Philco Town and Country I was working on. That also had AGC issues, which I eventually traced back to a bad contrast control. Uh, so this could have some similar issues. So that's why I want to continue my investigation. Because when you feed in a strong signal, like from one of these converter boxes, there's no reason to get a faint picture whatsoever. That's a very strong, clear signal that comes out of that box. So definitely some issues going on somewhere between the tuner and the output of the video amp. Sounds not so hot either, for that matter. Well, I think I just discovered one little problem here. This side is the VHF antenna jack, so I've got my Balin going to my digital converter box. And the other side goes to some twin lead that goes into the tuner. And guess what? We've got a break. I remember this happened in another set some time ago, and it also spent, took me way too long to find that problem. Certainly longer than it should have. I think it might have been my Motorola 12K2. So I will strip off a little bit of insulation there, figure out where the heck that's supposed to get reattached to, and solder it back on.
I repaired that antenna connection, but the set still clearly has some issues. One thing I've noticed is that when the set is cold and you first turn it on, the vertical height is much shorter. And actually that, that's good because I've got the control all the way to the extreme now to make it shorter. Once the set warms up, the vertical starts stretching out more and more. The other thing I've noticed is that there seems to be a loose connection, or at least a dirty connection inside the tuner. Turn the set back on now. What I've noticed is that I have to uh, tap this control to get a decent picture and decent sound. And a slight bit of jarring will knock it out of uh, being good again. So see how the picture is kind of short now? It doesn't fill the whole screen. After a minute or two or three, this will start getting stretching taller and taller and taller. Also notice how the picture kind of goes in and out. So right now it's not that bad, although it's a bit squished. And there it goes bad again. I tap this control. Occasionally getting there. There we go. It's, it's a pretty good sharp picture right there. If it would just stay like that. Put a slight tap, and it goes out again. <laughs> now, tuner. Okay, things are looking a little better now. Well, actually, a lot better. I did find a proper uh, 6BQ7 for the tuner, and I popped that in. And I replaced the 12C5 tube on the vertical output, and now I no longer have a pitcher that continues to grow as the set warms up. And uh, it's not so touchy anymore. I'm, I can tap on the... Uh, Fine tuning and the picture's not all going crazy. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of flickering, but uh, it doesn't go all faint, and then I have to keep fiddling with it. <laughs> of course, as I say that, it goes out again. I think what the real culprit was with the loose connection is the local distance switch. So there it's on local mode, and they're distant mode, and see how it's all kind of speckly? If I fiddle with the switch, It's a slide switch, it's a DPDT switch. I can get it to be kind of good. What I'm thinking I might do is just bypass that switch entirely. I just want to lock it into the position where the best image comes through. And I have tried shooting some contact cleaner in there. I think it's just kind of a flaky, cheap switch. So I don't see any reason to just hardwire this stuff such that we always get the best picture. Nobody's going to be likely to be needing to switch it from local to distance since there really are no transmissions anymore. Even if you use a blonder tongue, I think you're always going to have a pretty strong signal. So, uh, Also, I did check these resistors. There's a resistor network. There are four resistors in there. And the one I was able... One of them was definitely out. It's a 680 ohm resistor. Alright, things are looking a lot better now. I've dug up a proper 6BQ7 tube and popped that into the tuner and it seems more stable now. And I replaced the 12C5 vertical output tube when the pitcher no longer grows in height as the set warms up. The local distance switch is still flaky though and that's what I think some of the issue was that I was attributing to the tuner being uh, having a loose connection proper uh, possibly. So right now it's in one position. If I throw it into the other, it's still kind of staticky. This is just a really cheap DPDT switch. Going back and forth. And there's a resistor network in here to attenuate the signal. Well, if I put it into one position, there's essentially no picture anymore. In the other position, there is a decent picture and sound, but it's sometimes staticky. And if you kind of fiddle with the switch, you can get it to come in a lot stronger. 
So now there we got a lot of snow, but if I fiddle with it a little, I can get a better picture. So what I'm thinking I'm going to do, since there's really no need to have a local distance switch, since anybody using this set is going to be feeding in an artificial signal from something, then I might as well just hardwire that switch to give me the best possible signal coming through. So what I want to do next is one, hardwire that switch, and two, I want to take the setback apart and replace the selenium with a silicon diode and a dropping resistor. Somebody had asked me to do a, a segment on that to see how I might go about determining what value resistor to use. And something else I want to deal with. Down in there, I'm not sure if you guys can see that, there's a white cylinder down here. That's actually a power resistor. And that gets really, really hot. That's for the filament string. It's that guy right there. I said that's only 15 watts, but man, that thing kicks out a lot of heat. The reason they have that in there is if you add up all these tube filament voltages, apparently you don't get 117 volts. So I'm going to jot down all these tube filaments and add them up and see what I've got. Um, well, I guess if, you're, if this is to be believed, it should be 86 volts. Uh, I can plug that into a formula and either use a silicon diode, possibly in series with a resistor, or a non-polarized capacitor to drop that in a manner that does not dissipate heat. So I was thinking that perhaps I could replace this big power resistor with another more efficient technique to cut down the filament voltage. But turns out there's a little problem. On the schematic here they show the various tubes connected in series. A few of them are on a second sheet that's not on the screen right now. And they show the voltage increasing as you go through the chain. So for example at this point here they show 41 volts VAC. Then we go through a 12 volt tube, and now we have 53 volts AC. Another 12 volt tube, and then 65 volts AC. And then we get to this tube, which is a 19 volt tube. However, they'd show it going from 65 to 74, which is only a 9 volt increase, not 19 volts. So they actually made a mistake on this. And then they get 12 and they get to 86. But really that should be 96. And even then they kind of rounded things off a bit and fudged the numbers because if you really accurately pull up all those tube voltages, you'll get this. There we go. If you add up these tube voltages, you should actually get 98.65. When they say a tube is say a 3 volt tube, it's actually 3.15 volts. A 4 volt tube is 4.2. A 5 volt tube is 4.7. So if you add all these up, you get 98.65, I'll call it 99 volts for simplicity's sake. So if we then go over to this handy calculator, and if I plug those numbers in, 117 for the supply volts, 60 hertz, 99 volts on the heater, drawing 0.6 amps. For a dropper resistor, we get 30 ohms, which is exactly what they used in this set. It dissipates about 11 watts. Now I was hoping I could use a dropper resistor and diode, which is what I used in my Admiral T102 set. However, we're only talking about dropping down uh, about 18 volts. And if you use a diode, it's just cutting out way too much voltage. We could go with a capacitor though, a non-polarized capacitor in series with the line which will come out to about 26 microfarads, which is pretty, pretty darn big. Now the reason I was hoping that this what really was about 86 volts is that, that's kind of a magic number, or more accurately about 85 is, especially if you consider that the line voltage is more like 120 volts these days. Because if you use a resistor, <coughs> sorry, if you use a diode, in series with the AC line, and you have 125 volts on the supply, and your heater chain is 85 volts, you don't need a resistor at all. Basically, you just put a diode in series and you're done. You might want to add a resistor for a little surge protection, though. 
And that's what I did with my Admiral T-102. The supply, the, uh, the heater series string came out to right around 85 volts. So I was able to just use a diode and a CL90 current limiting thermistor. And that was it. Done. Virtually no power loss in that set. But that's not what we've got. We've got about 99 and if I... Around here, supply voltage at the wall is actually more like 125. So if you plug all that in, you get these negative nonsense numbers here, so you just can't use a diode. Could use a resistor, and you can see why that one's probably getting so hot now, is that I don't have 117 volts. I have over 120 volts in my outlet. So that resistor is actually trying to uh, drop even more. And for the capacitor, we got about 21 microfarads. Now I've been putting zero in for this surge limiter. The default is 10. What that's for is it's best to put a little resistor in series with the capacitor to provide a little surge limiting when you first turn the set on. So if we factor all that in to 125 that I measure in my outlet, the 99 correct heater voltage, a 10 volt surge limit drop. These are the numbers we come up with. About 26 microfarads plus a 17 ohm resistor which is going to put out around 6 watts. So if I factor all that together it's really not compelling enough for me to make these changes just to save shave a few watts off because I'll have to put a pretty darn big capacitor Typically people use AC motor run capacitors, which are pretty hefty. And I could probably get away with 22 microfarads, that would be close enough. That's going to be a 22 microfarad cap, say rated at least 160 volts AC. That's going to be a pretty big capacitor, so I'd have to find somewhere to stick that in the cabinet. And then I'm still going to need this resistor. So I just don't think it's worth bothering with, and I'm just going to leave the resistor that's in the set alone.